<laughs> so let's let's talk about homophobia in the black mm. community. This is a very, very sensitive topic. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Chris checking in with another video. I hope you are doing well. It is my honor to introduce a friend of mine, Moses. He is from Uganda. He is an excellent, such an intelligent human being. And we have been ha Thanks, having, Chris. <laughs> of course, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we have been having so many yeah. talks recently about what it means to be black, the black diaspora, how we can be more involved, the awkwardness between our two communities, transgenerational pain, etc. And I'm so happy to have him on a guest to get into some, some topics. I'm African American, um, ethnically from Nigeria and Cameroon. He is African from the continent, born and raised in Uganda. We're two black men coming together to have a very serious conversation about the black community, the black diaspora in general. Okay, are you ready? I am. All right, great. Yeah. So first, I want you to tell us who you are, where you come from, and what brings you to America. My name is Moses uh, Roharo. And uh, like you said, I'm from Uganda. I came to the US two years ago to pursue my studies in graduate school. I finished in May, and um, I'm happy that I got a, a job with the UN Foundation. So I was uh, born in the western part of Uganda. So Uganda has four regions, the central, western, east, and the north. And I am from the western part. Ethnically, I am Randis. Um, yeah, but, my, uh, but I was born in Uganda, so that's my nationality. Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie once said that the notion of blackness was only made aware to her when she came to a predominantly white country, i.e. the United States. She went to graduate school here. Has it been the same for you? Yes, it has been the same for me. I, I think uh, it is difficult not to experience that uh, because, you know, at least where we, come, like, where we come from as Africans, you know, everybody is black, uh, mm -hmm. or at least most people are black. Uh, and uh, when we're here, everything's like almost, you know, racialized. Everybody, you know, everywhere you go, oh, he's black, you know, he's this, you know, he's Latino, Hispanic. So, you know, you become a, a way of who you are as a person, as opposed to, you know, if you were in Africa where, you know, you, these questions never really come to cross your mind. Okay. We talk heavily about race, as you know, in the United States. Could you express what it feels like to be uh, interacting with this culture in America where, you know, we, we care about race, we talk about race often, like this notion of blackness in the United States. So what has it been like for you, especially since in Uganda, you wouldn't necessarily be engaged with, like your race wouldn't be engaged with this way? Honestly, Christy, I mean, I'd, I'd have to uh, say it has been a bit difficult because race, you know, it's kind of like you, they, they generalize you. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Moses and uh, he's black. That has to come with all the stereotypes that come with, you know, uh, you know, blackness, being black in this country, mm -hmm. you know, the assumptions people have about you um, that you have to sort of, you know, uh, accept because that's, that's how society brands you or how that's how society sees you. There were, there were instances where I felt I was, general, you know, I was like categorized, uh, you know, I wasn't judged as, as an individual. I was okay. judged as somebody who belongs to this group and therefore, uh, you know, the people expect you to behave like mm -hmm. them. Now, my next question is actually in response to that, like basically, because we live in a predominantly white country. Mm. Um, I think 60% uh, of this country is white, but you've also lived in this country with other African-Americans. So I'm just curious to see what that has been like for you to interact with African-Americans within this new identity that you have now of being black. Um, to be honest, uh, it's been good and bad at the same time. There were times when I felt it, it was difficult for me to fit, to fit in uh, in the African American community. And I, I get it because of the cultural differences uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, we, we, we have and where we come from. I would maybe attend a, a, you know, like a party and you know, my friends called me to, you know, to be a part of them. And I, you know, I, I kind of felt out of place. There was always this invisible wall. Whoa, we between, talked about that. Yeah, yeah, between, <laughs> between you know, me and them. Um, and mm. it's difficult to like, kind of like break it down and you know, sort of be, be, be one, you know, because my assumption coming here was that um, you know, we are one. You realize that, oh, hold on, there's a difference in culture here, right. and, uh, and therefore you have to accept that. So many Africans often complain that they experience the most racism from African Americans here in the United States than they do from white people. So what do you think this wall is between our cultures? Like, why do you think that's, that exists? And what do you think we can do about it to, to, to bring those walls down so we can have more communication between our communities? Uh, Chris, that's a very good question. Um, I think the reasons are both historical, 
mm -hmm. and contemporary. Okay. Uh, historical because you know the, the media has always portrayed Africa to be this dark continent. You know they would portray Africa as this you know war torn zone. I mean uh, you know the people that are savage, you know feminine and all that. And therefore, African Americans you know were sold an image about Africa and Africans in general. And therefore, they, they you know when, when they see us, that's the image that comes to 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 their mind. Okay. And um, I think that has gone on to you know, make them have preconceived notions about, about who we are Africa. as a people. You know, that can only be changed if we become more uh, educated about about Africa. our people and African yeah. continent. Even us, mm -hmm. as, as as Africans, I think, you know, you know, likewise, we are fed with this with this image of African Americans. Mm -hmm. Back at home, we don't know really. Yeah. We, we, we've never really, <laughs> we, we've never lived with African Americans. So we, we, what we see on TV, we see. African Americans, you know, living a certain way, mm. and uh, you know, we kind of like have also our own uh, preconceived opinions and notions about them. You know, the, the music, for instance. Okay, the music. Uh, the music, uh, the culture, the ghetto culture, quote unquote, ghetto culture, and how that is very much misaligned to African culture. Uh, the indifference to uh, to education, for instance, to maybe religion as as, a, as an institution, yet it creates friction between the groups that are Africans and African Americans. So what do you think the most valuable lesson both communities, so we have the African Americans as well as you know Africans of the continent, can learn from each other vis-a-vis -vis reckoning with legacies, for example, of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, that may create this wall that you spoke about earlier that makes it difficult for us to communicate with each other? First of all, there's much more that unites us as a people mm -hmm. than there is that, you know, that uh, divides us or that make that, you know, we, people think that we are so different. I don't think we're different, yeah, so different. I feel like there's much more that really unites us as, uh, as Africans, regardless of whether you are in Caribbean, from the Caribbeans or uh, African-Americans or Africans in the continent. If you look at the story of the African immigrant in this country, it's remarkable. Many Africans who come here, they aren't so fluent, for instance, in English. If I find a Cameroonian or a Chad, a Chadian or uh, somebody from uh, Tunisia or wherever who isn't so fluent in these languages, but then they're still going to make it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that speaks to the sense of possibility that if you come here with the, with the, with the, with the right uh, values and work ethics, you can really make it. Uh, about the African American, what we can learn from them is, you know, you know, uh, perseverance. Uh, there's, wow. there's a lot that African Americans have gone through, but they've still found a way of how to make their voices heard and how to, you know, uh, like I said, make a way where there seems to be no way. Black culture is American culture. And so um, I, th I think there's a lot to learn from that. So I am a huge fan of Afrobeats, basically. Yeah. I actually got exposed to Afrobeats when I was living in, in China. There was wow. a large African community there. Yeah. And it was I just love it. It's my favorite genre of music next to dance hall. Music has been a very huge cultural influence among the African diaspora and African Africans on the continent. Do you think art and music are being used to unite um, you know, the black community, the black diaspora, when Black leaders worldwide are struggling to do that through la various language barriers, political barriers, etc. Absolutely. I'll give an example of French Montana. Uh, he, he, he was in Uganda, I think it was a few years ago. Uh, he, uh, he identified a few young boys and girls mm -hmm. called the Ghetto Kids, mm -hmm. um, and he flew them to New York City. They did a performance. Um, you know, uh, on one, one of the biggest stages in, uh, in New York. The act of him flying to Uganda to see these kids and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, investing in them, yeah. flying them to, the, to New York, spoke to what, what is possible, really, between these two Between the, the two communities. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, I see it, you know, uh, happening all the time. You see people like Banner Boy, you know, sitting out, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stadiums, you know, in London, in, in, London. in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, I feel like... If, if politics fails us, I think music will, 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 will at least unite us because okay. it's happening already. Yeah. And uh, it's, 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 it's a movement that's, that's uh, gaining momentum every, so, every, every day. I think music will, do, will have united us much more uh, mm -hmm. as a people than anything like politics. So let's, let's yeah. talk about homophobia in the black mm. community. This is a very, very sensitive topic. So how do you think we as black people are addressing homophobia in our community? Um, and do some communities around the world do better than others? Is religion per colonialism the root cause of violent homophobia in black communities worldwide as many of our queer ancestors were accepted in African societies prior to European imperialism, do you think? Yeah, I mean, Chris, that's a, a very timely question uh, that you've asked. And uh, 
I mean, what I would say about homoph homophobic um, sentiments in, in many of our cultures in Africa, um, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, you know, we have to understand that, um, you know, religion plays a huge role in this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Africa is, is the most religious continent in the world. And, as, and that comes with its own consequences. Uh, uh, you know, how, 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 how does a Christian or a Muslim interpret homophobic, I mean, uh, uh, LGBT, for instance, or a queer person, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they will react to, the, to that category of people based off on what they, what, what they are preached to or what and they churches. Read, in churches, and, in churches, okay. in churches and all that. Okay. And so, I mean, I guess that explains, you know, even the legislations that are being passed. Uh, the legislation? Yeah, that are okay. being passed in, in many of our countries. Like in Uganda, for instance, uh, there, was a, there was a very uh, draconian law that was passed mm -hmm. a, few, a few months ago, if you, if you, remember, if you remember. And, uh, you know, it's no surprise because, you know, about 85% about of, uh, of people in, in, a, in, a, in my country are, um, are religious. And so that kind of plays into the whole homophobic, homophobic sentiments, sentiments and all that. And yes. a pushback against the communities. Ex exactly, okay. exactly. I believe with time, uh, you know, we see as our societies develop, uh, you know, they, you know they, they, they become more, I'd say, liberalist and, and, uh, and uh, more accepting, okay. you know, towards people that aren't like them. My hope is that as we grow as a nation, as, as a people, as we develop as a people, uh, we will be more accepting and we'll have, you know, uh, a place for everybody, regardless of what their sexual um, um, mm -hmm. orientation uh, is. Exactly. I agree. Um, yeah. oh, I hope that. I hope that for all of us. I hope that for our community, honestly. I really do. Yeah. I agree. You know, the more, like, I've known you, Chris, for instance. I mean, you have been a very good uh, teacher of mine in regards oh. to... <laughs> 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 about to, about to, I mean, that is something that I, I honestly um, uh, had never really thought of that I would be, uh, you know, this close to someone like you. Oh, my God. So um, that, that's the beauty of, yeah. of you know, of, of having these interactions, these conversations and all that. I have know? to I have yeah. to say this. Honestly, you guys, um, Moses and I have been friends for about a year. And yeah. he told me, he said, Chris, like, I haven't had a close relationship or a friendship with an african-american yeah. in two years you're like my one of my first friends that i can actually sit down and have a conversation mm. with and that actually mm. makes me really sad yeah it makes me really sad that um that you know you come to this place and you see people who look like you that you know you would think that you could approach and you're not embraced that actually that makes me really sad mm. and we've had some very very deep conversations and we have disagreements but mm. at the end of the day i i fully respect you I, I, I really, um, you know, I really care a lot about you. So thank you so much for educating me as well, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because yeah. you've gotten me together. <laughs> okay, so correcting yeah. some of my misperceptions. And yeah. I think this is progressive. I really appreciate mm. these discourses. Mm. I want to ask, so I think when we think about fulfillment, right? Like the American dream, you know, um, in America, I think a lot of African-Americans are pursuing the American dream, you know? Um, so I wanted to know what, does fulfillment look like for you um, as you grow into like a huge, you know, hopefully inspiring person? You're gonna work for the United Nations in the future. What does success look like for you? And um, yeah, what do you hope to do with it? Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question, uh, Chris. And for me, in 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 just one word, fulfillment is empowerment. It's empowerment. It's empowerment. Fulfillment is empowerment. Okay. Um, because you know, at least where I come from, opportunities are very, they are unevenly distributed. Uh, you, you, you find, uh, you know, only few have opportunities. And mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, having been blessed with the opportunity of coming to the U.S. and uh, having an education in the U.S. Um, and, you know, all that, what, what that entails, uh, I, I feel like, you know, it's my obligation to go back and see how I can also empower people in my community, not just in, in Uganda, but also here. In America, yeah, too. Yeah, just, you okay. know, being you know, uh, what I can or what we can mm -hmm. with what we have to empower people. Uh, because the truth is that, you know, many of our people, they, they, they need someone to, you know, to pull them up. Like, I feel like if we don't, who will at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know if you are not in the right environment yeah. to, 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 to hone uh, the, the, skills the skills and all that, then, you know, how do I want to do much, really? Yeah. But if you have somebody who is willing to invest in you, who's willing to give you their time and resources to, you know, to, to, to see you become a better person, I think that would be fulfillment. Uh, you know, a, a bit selfish to just, you know, say, yeah, I'm, I've, I've arrived and therefore, America, yeah, that's it, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Uh, to, you know, 10 years down the road, 
I don't think I'll be, you know, proud of that decision, really. Well, guys, I, I hope you guys enjoy this chat. Um, this is one of the millions and millions and millions of chats that I've had with Moses about like identity, what it means to be African, African American, be part of the diaspora. And I'm like, you gotta come on my, you know, YouTube channel. We yeah. can talk about this. So. Mm -hmm. I really hope that you guys like this exchange. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here, Moses. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have yeah. you, honestly. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Comment, like, subscribe, share this video if you care. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.